you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we shall be discussing Christoph Romuald, the heroic protagonist in Vampire the Masquerade Redemption. We shall discuss his origins, motives, and what sort of cultures this kindred lives. During our discussions, you have probably got the impression that I am not terribly fond of clans Toreador and Brujar, and <laughs> you'd be right. Whilst the clan of the Rose are repulsive hypocrites in every aspect of the words, at least they are able to actually contribute meaningful ideas and movements to kindred society. When not the playflings of the barley, the learned clan do an awful lot of thinking, whining, moaning, fighting, complaining, screaming, shouting, and not really getting anything done. It is a miracle that the Anarch Free States were ever formed at all. <laughs> But of course, what I have just described to you is one highly offensive and yet mostly true stereotype of the Bruja. After all, Theo Bell did pave the way for the Anarch movement to become a proper sect when he decided to destroy his ruler, something I have mentioned before and something I could elaborate on another night if that interests you. There are some Bruja who are actually able to get things done and live up to their rebellious freedom-fighting namesakes, other than anarchic temper tantrums. I have met one of these Bruja. A Bruja who swears no allegiance to any of the sects, one that is speculated in rumour and modern legend. I have met his sire too, a month before she lost her rank of Bishop of New York City in America. I speak of the first child of a Katerina the Wise, Christoph Romuald, who, on the 1st of January 2000, saved our world from a powerful Methuselah, which, I assure you, is no exaggeration. Christoph explained to me that he was the second son of a minor noble in northern western France, which was an interesting note, for I had always got the impression he was an only child and totally lacked the French accent. Anyway, he would participate in the Eastern Crusades as a member of the Order of the Sword Brethren, which I assumed he meant the Livonian Brothers of the Sword, a Catholic military order established by Albert the First Bishop of Riga in 1202, but I suppose human historians have rewritten history to please their own agendas. Or was it the Canaanites? Anyway, in 1194, Christoph would fight in the Morovian Hills, led by his kinsman, Sir Cuthbert. With his effort, strength and courage, he and his brethren would claim victors in the battle. Alas, this adventurer would take an arrow to the knee and chest, causing him to fall in battle. His sword brethren left him in the care of the nuns of the convent of the Knights of the Red Cross in Prague, while they continued to pursue their enemies who, I'm told by Christoph, were the pagans. His wounds were fatal and it was presumed that he was dead or about to die with no chance of survival. One nun did not give up hope, however. A nun by the name of Aneska, who would fall in love with Christoph as he would do with her. This love between them would play an important part of Christoph's story and his ascension to greatness. The convent in which he stayed would be attacked by slackters, which, in case you have forgotten, are the hideous monstrous ghouls crafted by Clan Zemitsi. While still recovering from his wounds, Christoph sought upon himself to fight the nocturnal threat where no one else could be bothered to. It is a gesture that is both as grand as it is suicidal. <laughs> He would travel to the nearby Bon Silver Mines that some of the Zemitsi claimed as their domain and slaughtered them, sending them to the Abyss. It is something he said a lot during our discussions, so I hardly think it was the Abyss that La Sombra wielded, especially when you consider the fact that he took on the Zemitsi as a mortal. Along with them was an Azra the Unliving, a Zemitsi with long red hair and many a feature heavily altered by vicissitude. From her maw were large fangs and bony ridges on her forehead. Christoph also spoke of a cloak made out of living flesh which moved on its own. An arrogant display of the discipline if I ever saw one. Azra was one of several Zemitsi who worked on the reawakening of the Methuselah of Visserad, Vukudlak, an infamous defiler of sanctification and pureness amongst the Voivods. He plotted the eventual mastery of the earth. Such knowledge is harrowing to bear, but it was something Christoph could do very little about at the time. 
That said, it would not be long before he could action this, for the death of Azra gained him instant notoriety among all of Prague's citizens, mortal and kindred alike. The Archbishop of Giza grew lustful over Aneska and jealous of Kristoff for being the centre of her world and not him. He would send Kristoff to patrol the streets at night to protect the city from the remaining slachter that would attack the city, which led the convent open for the now extinct revenant family, the Premisils, who sought Kristoff after he killed Azra the Unliving. Later that night, Kristoff and Aneska would confess their love to each other, resulting Kristoff to leave the convent, not wanting any more harm to come to her. I would learn from his sire-to-be, a Katharina the Wise, that the Primisals, and by extension the Zemitzi, had placed a contract on Kristoff's head, which would spur her to embrace him that night, turning him into a Cainite of Clan Bruja. He would be taught in the way of the Promethean, who were the strangely hopeful vampires who wanted to recreate Carthage. Well, the more peaceful elements of it at least. What would unfold across his nights of the Generation 9 fledgling were countless of stories that I shall not bore you with, for Christoph went into great detail of all of them with me, and I know we do not have the time for me to give you a word-by-word -word account of his adventures, so I shall do my best to summarise those events for you now. He would end a Cappadocian conspiracy and fought a golem in Prague's Jewish quarter, both agreeing to fervent aid to the Brujar cause, the Jewish people and the Cappadocians, I mean. Christoph would learn from his sire about the war against the Tremere and Zemitzi, something we have discussed many times before. What took Christoph's interest in it, however, was that the Tremere would be selling off mortal slaves, and Aneska was highly likely to be among them, for she went looking for Christoph. He was given permission by the Prince Brandle to cease their efforts and rescue many immortal slaves from their Tremere captors. In this chantry, he and his coterie would rescue the slaves and an Eric the Gangrel. Learning that a lot of the mortal slaves were being taken to Vienna, Christoph, his fellow Promethean Willem, Cappadocian Serana, and Eric would head there and find their whereabouts. They would kill a Lassomba Luther Black for the Ventru Orsi, who promised to tell them where the slaves were. This, of course, was a lie, and they were captured, but not for long, as they broke out and travelled to the Horse to Hexi, when the infamous Tremere Etrius told the Dark Ages coterie that the slaves were being used and probably abused by the Zemitzi. But only after the coterie fought Etrius, and after he performed some powerful magic to turn Eric into a gangrel, forcing the coterie to kill him. It was this imprisonment in Vienna that Christoph would obtain the Ancon Sword, something I did not believe truly existed before he kindly showed me the weapon. It is not a laughing matter, Neonate, so remove that smile from your face immediately. This sword is a legendary vampiric artifact beyond anything you can comprehend. It is a weapon that is said to be the sister to the Sword of Dracula, which cuts down supernatural entities with aggravating ease and is said to be able to absorb blood from the souls of those who kills with the weapon. It was designed to slay Capula, so do not scorn the power within the sword. The Ankern, on the other hand, is said to be as strong as the Methuselahs, with the added ability to cut down lupines of ease and potentially allowing the wielder to travel to the land of the dead, the Shroud, the Abyss. Some of my research would indicate that it may be far stronger than the Sword of Dracula, but Kristoff seems to believe it is just much, much weaker. But I digress. Kristoff and co would return back to Prague and find most of it were now up in flames. Prince Brandel was dead and the mortals were rioting, performing witch hunts, burning down vampires and attempting to storm Castle Viserad. The coterie would join them, but it was only the vampires that would proceed beyond the gate, for the kind never stood a chance against the many Zemitzi, Slachter and the large Vods in their paths. How these neonates achieved this is beyond me. Anyway, they would find that the slumbering Vukudlag had enslaved Aneska as a ghoul. Aneska would reject Kristoff as she prepared to revive Vukudlag, but the outside assault collapses the castle upon them. Kristoff would fall into torpor, waking in London in 1999, in a Society of Leopold facility where the nutjob hunters didn't stand a chance against the powerful Ruja. Christoph spoke that it was there, through various records the Society of Leopold had collected, that he learned of the Camarilla and the Sabbat, but it would take him a much longer time to learn of the Anarchs. From these files, Christoph also got the impression that Vukudlag could still be stopped and Aneska could be saved, for he got the impression that the Zemitzi had 
gold her, which was the same conclusion I came to. Kristoff then spoke of an Asamite who took on the role of a Bruja called Pink, who's not to be confused with my Nosferatu associate by the same name. Anyway, this Banu Hakim agreed to help Kristoff, only to delay the awakening of them the Methuselah Vukudlak. They learned that the Setites, which I seem to remember held a very strong presence over London during the 80s and 90s, were shipping smuggled viscerad materials to New York City in the United States of America. Mm, I have to admit to you, Chad, that I may have had a part in this under-the-counter negotiations, but I didn't inform Kristoff of this. I didn't particularly want to kill an angry Bruja in my domain, and Colin didn't need to destroy more furniture. Anyway, they would kill the Setite head Lucrita and recruit Lily, a blood-bound Torador prostitute, on the way. The three would travel to New York City, rescuing a Nosferatu called Samuel from the Sabbat, which had ruled New York for the longest time, who joined them on their journey to deal with the Sabbat Nosferatu beneath the city, the portrayal of Pink, the Giovanni working with the Setites in London, and the surprise and somewhat anticlimactic showdown with Orsi, which caused a lot of this madness. Those were Kristoff's words not mine. Willem would join the Free Knights once more, hoping to regain some of that humanity he had lost being part of the Sabbat for some 800 years. Coward. Together, they would discover that Vukudlak was hidden beneath a church and had constructed his own cathedral of flesh, unlike the cathedral of flesh proper, with Aneska still in his servitude. They found that Vukudlak had awoken and tried to influence Kristoff by offering him Aneska before revealing that she is completely dependent on Vukudlak's blood and would die without him, implying that she would be bloodbound to Vukudlak as well as Kristoff. Kristoff, being a well-educated Bruja and like an idiot like the vast majority of his clan, refuses and Vukudlak would drop the group into the tunnels beneath the cathedral, hoping his creations would kill them. They don't. I should mention once more that this cathedral of flesh differs greatly from the original, as I previously stated. Kristoff explained that the church's limestone was subtly replaced by a more fleshly form of building material, mortar transformed into blood, with bones forming the panels. He also explained that there were pillars consisting of bodies, emblems of entrails, brickwork of skeletons, floors of bellies and roofs of disgusting decomposition, where the sounds of flesh and agony could be heard, accompanied by the smells most indescribable. It also contained what Kristoff called the Wall of Memories, which held Aneska's memories of the last millennia, showing she continued to hope as Vukudlak found new ways to defile and torment her. She would eventually sacrifice her innocence to gain Vukudlak's trust, using her position to delay his resurrection over hundreds of years until, with no options left, she prayed for Kristoff's return, which he believed caused him to awake from torpor. How a mere ghoul was able to do this is beyond me. My only guess is that the ye old magic of love truly does exist. Eventually, the modern knight Kotri would do battle with the Methuselah and, with some sheer dumb luck, were able to send the Sunnitsi to final death. Kristoff would then embrace Aneska to make sure that she would survive without the blood of her former master. In some sense, she was free. Kristoff spoke very little of what he did after all of this, which is not surprising given he is actually rather new to this world still. That and everything thereafter would pale in comparison to slaying a Methuselah and saving the fucking world. Most notably, he participated in two major battles in New York City during this time. First was the portrayal of Marcus Vettel, the ex-prince of Washington, D.C., and later the destruction of Leopold, the Tremere anti-tribute host of the Eye of Hazemel, which was slain by him and the Ankhan sword. That said, I have heard from others stating that it was Theo Bell, a gang girl by the name of Ramona, and Victoria of Ash of Clan Toreador who destroyed the Tremere anti-tribute, but we will explore those in further nights, I'm sure, and you're more than entitled to believe what you wish. Kristoff is truly something to aspire to, child. He is not a vampire who clings to his humanity as many others do. He knows he's a vampire, knows that he is one of the damned, and that there is no point trying to be human too much. It is highly likely that he follows a path of enlightenment or a road which the paths originate from, most of which encourage the kindred to abandon their humanity, and replace it with a more philosophical path of enlightenment you see what I did there. <laughs> I believe he is a canite that has performed diabolery on more than one occasion. Now, I do not judge, for I too am a vampire who has performed the Amaranth, for my path encourages that in the right circumstances. Now, do not give me that look, child. If I wanted to eat you, you wouldn't have survived the first night. <laughs>
Just because Kristoff may have partaken in what some of your ilk call the Forbidden Snack does not mean that he is a monstrous or villainous canine. I think our little chat says the inverse of this to the ninth degree. As I've said, he is something to aspire to. He is a noble vampire with strong convictions that prevent him from succumbing to the beast. He is a vampire who follows his own morales, doing what he can to improve society for those around him, whether it is kind or kindred. He is a true Promethean at heart. Now, if there were only other Brujas like him, we might be able to fight the Second Inquisition and end this madness once and for all. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time... Farewell.